Our ideologists have not succeeded in moving revolutionary theory forward by one step in black Africa. Indeed, though one must be armed with so fecund a scientific method of analysis as Marxist dialects, assuming it had been sufficiently assimilated, it would be hopeless to try to apply it to a reality of which one is totally ignorant. For a long time, many of our compatriots have thought they could get by without any deep knowledge of African society and Africa in all aspects, history, languages, ethnicities, energy potential, raw materials, and the like. The conclusions reached have often been abysmally banal, when not plain and simply wrong. They have thought they could make up for the lack of ideas, breath, and revolutionary perspectives by the use of offensive, excessive, and murky vocabulary. They forgot that the true revolutionary quality of language is its demonstrative clarity based on the objective use of facts and their dialectical relationships, which results in irresistibly convincing the intelligent reader. In February 1952, when I was Secretary General of the Democratic African Rally of Students, we posed the problem of the political independence of the black continent and the creation of a future federated state in an article entitled Toward a Political Ideology in Black Africa. This article, which was in fact but a foreshadowing of my The African Origin of Civilization, Myth or Reality, considered political, linguistic, historical, social, and other aspects of the question. At that time, apart from the Malagasy deputies and the Cameroonian leader Ruben Um Nayobe, there were certainly no French-speaking black African politicians who dared to voice the concepts of African nations, independence, or let's face it, culture. Today's after-the-fact statements endorsing such ideas are almost frauds. At the least, they are barefaced misrepresentations. It would be illuminating to trace the history of the actual positive use, not just as trial balloons to be shot down, of these concepts by the fathers of African independence, even if the use preceded their writings. If the priorities indicated in this book had been taken into consideration in due time, especially insofar as hydroelectric development was concerned, Black Africa today would have nothing to fear from the economic problems created by the oil crisis and the drought. A rational industrialization program would consist first of all of harnessing the immense sources of energy which nature has given to Africa and thus making possible the whole process of development. In the beginning is energy, or else flows therefrom. While exploitation of such abundant energy might be a marketing challenge for private corporations to a developing country which must stimulate manifold activities and bring into the being the apparatus needed for its emergence into the industrial era, the idea of excess energy is pure nonsense. Part 1. Historical Unity. The Restoration of African historical consciousness. The time has come to draw practical conclusions from years of studying African problems, to sum them up in formulas that are as clear as possible and easy to apply. Chapter 1 Origins and History of the Black World. In all likelihood, present day African peoples are in no way invaders come from another continent. They are the Aborigines. Recent scientific discoveries that show Africa to be the cradle of humanity increasingly negate the hypothesis of this continent being peopled by outlanders. From the appearance of Homo sapiens, from earliest prehistory until our time, we are able to trace our origins as a people without significant breaks in continuity. In early prehistory, 
a great south-north movement brought the African peoples of the Great Lakes region into the Nile Basin. They lived there in clusters for millennia. In prehistoric times, it was they who created the Nilotic Sudanese civilization and what we know as Egypt. These first black civilizations were the first civilizations in the world, the development of Europe having been held back by the last ice age, a matter of a hundred thousand years. Beginning in the 6th century BC, 525, when Cambyses occupied Egypt, with the end of the independence of the great black power base, the African peoples until then, drawn to the Nile Valley as by a magnet, fanned out over the continent. Perhaps they then came upon small pockets of populations descended from Paleolithic or Neolithic infiltrations. A few centuries later, around the first century, they founded the first of the continental civilizations in the west and south, Ghana, Nakife, Zimbabwe, and others. We now know, thanks to radiocarbon methods, that the earliest sites in Zimbabwe do date back at least as far as the first century of the Christian era. On the east coast of Africa, Roman coins have been discovered at the port of Dunford, as well as in Zanzibar, indicating a flourishing sea trade. The first Nigerian civilization, which Bernard and William Fagg named the Nuk civilization, has been traced back to the first millennium BC, the ceramics found there being radiocarbon dated over a range from 900 BC to 200 AD. The Tariq es Sudan tells us that the city of Kukia on the Niger, former capital of Songhai before Gao, was contemporaneous with the time of the pharaohs. However that may be, we do know with certainty that in the 8th century AD the empire of Ghana was already in existence, extending over all of West Africa right to the Atlantic. So we can see that the African states of the Middle Ages had come into being practically when Egyptian Sudanese antiquity came to its close. The Nilotic Sudan was finally to lose its independence only in the 19th century and its old eastern province of Ethiopia would retain its identity until the Italian occupation of 1936, barring which it never lost its independence. That being the case, Ethiopia is in point of fact the oldest state in the world. Ghana lasted from about the 3rd century AD until 1240 to be succeeded by Mali from the date to 1464, a session of Sani Ali, founder of the Songhai Empire. The dismembering of these nations was effectively completed in the 19th century by the European occupation of Africa. The breaking up went on apace. What we saw then were tiny kingdoms, each jealous of its own independence, such as those of Cayor in Senegal, conquered by General Louis Fadeherb under Napoleon III at their fierce resistance. The kingdoms of East Africa, with trading cities on the coast, prospered from the end of classical antiquity until the 15th and 16th centuries when they fell to the Portuguese. These kingdoms maintained a lively trade with India, Siam, and the Chinese Far East, evidenced both by chronicles and by Chinese potteries found there. It is hard for us today to picture the opulence of the authentically black trading centers of that period. Father Gervais Matthew of Oxford in relating Swahili tradition, mentions that in these cities there were silver staircases leading to beds of ivory. Such luxurious furnishing are barely imaginable today. The houses, built of stone, rose to five or six stories. The people were authentic jet black Africans. Their women had shaven heads as in Ghana. These civilizations were overthrown by the Portuguese 
who in the 16th century altered the old trade routes and sea lanes of the Indian Ocean. The conception of African history just briefly sketched is today to all intents and purposes accepted and endorsed by scholars. Black African culture set for the whole world an example of extraordinary vitality and vigor. All vitalist conceptions, religious as well as philosophic, I am convinced came from that source. The civilization of ancient Egypt would not have been possible without the great example of black African culture, and in all likelihood it was nothing but the sublimation thereof. The history of the Nilotic Sudan, Egypt and present-day Ethiopia is well known. Until recently, however, the past of West Africa was related quite summarily. We have felt it necessary to bring this past to life through documents we have had at our disposal and by establishing a socio-historical analysis covering 2,000 years. The old political, social, and economic organization of black Africa over those 2,000 years, the military, judicial, and administrative apparatus, the educational setup, the university and technical levels, the pomp and circumstance of court life, the customs and mores, all details which had been presumed lost in the deep dark past, we were able to bring strikingly and scientifically back to life, especially in so far as West Africa was concerned, in pre-colonial black Africa. A similar work should be undertaken for the Benin Ife civilization. What will be of special interest there would be the fact that even in its ideological superstructure, the civilization of Benin borrowed nothing from either the Semitic or the Aryan worlds. On the other hand, it does display a close relationship with ancient Egypt, as might be expected. Its art, in a certain measure, represents African sculptural classicism. The same kind of exhumation and revivification work on our history for the period from antiquity to the present can and must be undertaken in a systematic way for all of Eastern, Central, and Southern Africa. Egyptian, Greek, Roman, Persian, Chinese, and Arabic documents known to exist and with what archaeology may add to them allow this to be done in large measure. Nowhere in African history are there holes that cannot be filled in. The empty spaces are only temporary, and the period that affects us runs without a break from Egyptian Sudanese antiquity and fits right in sequence. So, historical consciousness is properly restored. The general framework of African history is set out. The evolution of peoples is known in its broad lines, but the research, already begun, will have to be continued in order to fill the small gaps that still exist, thus reinforcing the framework. One can no longer see darkest Africa set against a deep dark past. The African can clearly follow his evolution from prehistory to our own day. Historical unity has become manifest. The psychological unity existing for all those who inhabit the dark continent and which each of us feels is an elementary fact that needs no demonstration. Geographical unity likewise is obvious and it necessarily implies economic unity. The latter is what we shall discuss in the pages devoted to the industrialization of Africa. A consideration of the structure of the pre-colonial African family, that of the state, the accompanying philosophical and moral concepts and the like, reveals a consistent cultural unity resulting from similar adaptations to the same material and physical conditions of life. This was the subject of my The Cultural Unity of Black Africa. There is also a common linguistic background. 
the African languages constitute one linguistic family as homogeneous as that of the Indo-European tongues. Nothing is easier than to set down the rules that allow transfer from a Zulu language, Bantu, to one of those of West Africa, Serer, Wolof, Peul, or even to ancient Egyptian. However, the old imperial languages, Saracole in Ghana, Mandingo in Mali, Songhai in Koaga, have had their areas of extension sharply reduced today. At the apogee of these African empires, the imperial tongues, the languages of trade and government affairs, were the African languages themselves. Even after the advent of Islam, Arabic always remained only the language of religion and erudition, as did Latin in Europe of the same period. With European occupation in the 19th century, the official African languages were replaced by those of the various mother countries. Local dialects surfaced and vied against the older national cultural languages which had virtually submerged them. It became less and less necessary for civil administration, politics, or social intercourse to learn the latter. The demands of daily life require learning the European languages. The disrepute of the old linguistic unities in our day reached its depth. While we may be able to build a federated African state covering all of the black continent, on the basis of historical, psychological, economic, and geographic unity, we will be forced, in order to complete such national unity and set it on a modern, autochthonous cultural base, to recreate our linguistic unity through the choice of an appropriate African tongue promoted to the influence of a modern cultural language. Linguistic unity dominates all national life. Without it, national cultural unity is but fragile and illusory. The wranglings within a bilingual country, such as Belgium, illustrate the point. Chapter 2. Linguistic Unity 1. Choice of language on a local scale and the framework of a given territory. 